Hi there, BC Calc. This is your video for 5.2, Writing Equations for Sequences and Sequence Characteristics. I've already worked on this in lesson 5.1, but I wanted to be more explicit about showing you um, some examples of how to write um, special sequences and how do you do an index shift, or rather, how do you write the sequence equation starting at different indices. Um, so we're gonna do examples for zero and one, but you could theoretically start your index at any point that you wanted to. So remember your index is an integer, usually starting at zero or one. Now, example number one is a sequence that is basically all of the even numbers. So pretty much even numbers, um, think about it like this. Even numbers are usually like two n, right? So two times one is two, two times two is four, two times three is six, and so on. So two n will give you even numbers. And two n plus one will give you odd numbers. And then in terms of do you need to add anything else um, or uh, do you need to subtract anything else, then that all depends on your index and where you start. So if you start at zero, and you want the first term to be zero, think about just using 2n, that's pretty simple, right? This is two times zero, this is two times one, this is two times two, this is two times three, and so on and so forth. So pretty much if your index starts at zero, you can say that the a sub nth term is gonna be 2n, and you can say the starting point is at zero. And so this is your index starting at zero. Now, if your index starts at one, then you can't say two times n because if let's say um, this is n is one, this is n is two, this is n is three, this is n is four, five, six, then if you do like two n for the first term, you would get two times one, so you'd be getting two and then two times uh, two would be four. And so you would kind of be missing this first term. Therefore, what you wanna do is you wanna think about a, a way that you can include the zero if you are starting at one. And so one way, um, there could be multiple ways to write a sequence. Um, one way is to take the index and subtract one from it. And so this is one thing you could do and I kind of don't have room here. I don't know what I was doing, uh, but if you start at one, then um, plugging n is one into this will give you one minus one is zero times two is zero. Then you go to two. Two minus one is one times two is two. Then you go to three. Three minus one is two times two is four, dot, dot, dot. And so you would get the same sequence as that. So pretty much these are the same thing. These are the same sequence, but they're index shifted. So just FYI. Um, and so what you can do now is try some of these other ones. And what you'll notice is on try this one, for example, it's like the same sequence almost except that that zero is missing. Um, for try this two, it's all the even numbers, but they start at 10. So if it's even numbers starting at 10, you might wanna think about as a hint, an equation of the form one over, you know, two n plus a something plus a constant of some kind. So the one obviously is on the numerator and then on the denominator, you have all the even numbers plus like the starting constant. Um, and again, it depends, the starting constant depends on your index, on your starting index. Now example two is all the odd numbers. So like I was saying before, your odd numbers are gonna be of this form, two n plus one. So an even number plus one. Um, if you are starting at, your n is zero. So if your index starts at n is zero, that's what this is. Then what you wanna do is um, think about if your n is zero, two times zero plus one gives you one. n is one gives you two times one plus one is three and so on. So pretty much this is just two n plus one. So that's that works. Now, if you wanna shift it and start your n at n is one, um, then again, this won't work because two times one plus one is three. So you would be kind of missing this point. And so one thing you can do again is like, just subtract one like we did before from the N. Um, and so this is gonna be 
2 times n minus 1 plus 1. And so if you start at 1, just test it to make sure that you get 1. 2 times 1 minus 1 is 0, plus 1 is 1. If you go to 2, 2 minus 1 is 1, times 2 is 2, plus 1 is 3. So the next term would be 3, so it would work. Now, obviously, this is kind of like convoluted, but I mean, it's thinking about this, but shifting this um, sideways um, by 1. Um, but you could also simplify it, right? So this is 2n minus 2 plus 1, so basically 2n minus 1. And so that makes sense that 2n minus 1 would actually be all the even numbers um, starting at 0 if your index starts at 1. Um, some of the other ones here, for example, this is, again, all of the odd numbers. And uh, you actually start at negative 3 instead of at 1. So you're just going to have to... Um, you're going to have to change this formula to start at negative three instead of one. Um, and then for try this number four, same thing. These are all the odd numbers starting at 51. So the two is the numerator and the denominator will be like some variation of the 2n um, plus one and then plus another constant. Example four is a special type of function that we are going to uh, talk about more in on the during the next lesson. So what you'll notice is that in order to get one, you are going to do one squared. In order to get four, you're going to do two squared. Um, in order to get sixteen, um, you're going to do four squared. In order to get sixty-four, you're going to do eight squared. So that's an example. So you'll notice that each one of them is squared. And what exactly is squared? Well, the numbers 1, 2, 4, 8, and so on. So basically, like, this is times 2 each time. The base is times 2. So the next thing you need to do is figure out, so again, this is n is 0, n is 1. So what is the equation for both of those indices? So one way to think about this, I'm going to make a little table over here, is um, let's just start by listing the ends. So if your n is 0, um, what's happening? Well, think these are basically powers of 2. So that's why you're multiplying by 2 each time. So this is basically 2 to the 0 squared. If your n is 1, this is like 2 to the 1 squared. n is 2. This is 2 to the 2 squared, and so on and so forth. 2 to the 3 is 8 squared. And so what you'll notice is that the 2 is constant. This exponent 2 is constant. And then basically, this is the n. And so when you write your equation, you get a sub n equals 2 to the n times 2, or 2 to the 2n is a prettier way to write it, and that starts at 0. Um, and if you do want to do an index shift, meaning like change um, this in order to make it start at n is 1, what would you have to do? Well, if n starts at 1, the first term still has to be this, right? So what you would do is you would do 2 and then instead of um, instead of one here, you don't want to do two to the one. You want to do um, so two to the n minus one, because if you plug in one, you should get one minus one is zero. Zero times two is zero. Two to the zero is one. And then same thing for this one. Two to the n minus one times two. That would work, right? So two minus one is one times two is two. Two to the two is four. So that would work. So this would be one, this would be four, and so on and so forth. Um, and so this would work. Um, and so you could say that a sub n equals two to the two n minus one. And this would be starting at n is one. One of the things you'll notice is that to do an index shift, it's like doing a function shift. So if you're trying to shift a function to the right, you would do like, you know, f of x plus one. Um, or, oops, I'm so sorry, x minus 1, my bad. Um, because moving to the right is actually minus, moving to the left is actually plus. 
And so pretty much that's what we're doing. We're doing like the N minus one um, in order to shift it to start at one, shifting it to the right. Now, the next thing that I wanna talk about is how do you do alternating sequences um, when your terms alternate plus, minus, plus, minus? So we recognize this as, um, as the function, um, basically as the, uh, as, the even, as even numbers. So these are even numbers starting at two. Um, so even numbers are basically two n, and then obviously depending on what the n is. Um, so this one, if the n is one, if you're starting at one, that's two n, right? So like this would be two n. Um, if you start at n is one. Um, if you start at n is um, zero, then you would have to do two n plus two. But you need to worry about what you would do um, to make this alternate plus minus plus minus. And to alternate, basically what you need to do is you need to put um, something, so like this term times a power of negative one. And you wanna make sure that that negative one starts um, in the right place. Like it starts uh, in this case positive and example 4b that it starts negative. So how do you make sure that it starts negative? Well. Basically, if you think about negative one, um, you know, negative one to the first power is negative one. Um, negative one to the second power is positive one. Negative one to the third power is negative one and so on and so forth. So basically you just want all the integers starting at one. And so in this case, it would literally just be to the n, right? So negative one to the one would give you a negative number. Oops, but we don't wanna start with a negative number. I was like skipping ahead and looking at that one. So we don't wanna start with a negative number, we wanna start with a positive number. And so in that case, we put n plus one. So if n, n is one, this starts out as one plus one is two, negative one to the two is positive. So that will give you a positive one times two n. So positive one times two will give you a positive two um, and so on and so forth. Um, now over here, uh, we are, doing um we're starting at n is zero and so once again we want to consider what if we do negative one to the n so negative one to the zero is one so that would give us positive then if we go to one n is one negative one to the one is negative so that's the second term and so on and so that works so that's pretty much how you do it um and then for example for b the only difference is that you start negative instead of positive so your sequence itself is still the same, uh, but then the negative one power will change. So how will that negative one power change? Well, um, in this case, you want the first term to be negative. So negative one to the n plus one, because you started zero, right? So zero plus one is one. So that would give you negative one to the one, would give you a negative number to begin with. And in this case, you would just have negative one to the n. And so negative one um, to the one would give you a negative number and that's what your starting number would be. So anytime you're doing an alternating sequence, you will see some variation of this where you'll have a negative one power um, or a power of negative one. Um, and so you can try the same thing here. Notice these are all even numbers starting at 12. So again, formula two n plus C and then um, the negative one power of something on the numerator. So that was it for examples of how to write equations. Now, one thing about a sequence is that a sequence has a similar limit to a function. So you can plot a sequence. And when you plot a sequence, pretty much the only difference between a sequence and a function is that a function is continuous and a sequence is discrete, meaning that you just see a bunch of points at the different ends instead of, um, instead of a continuously smooth function but properties of it are the same. So you can still have a limit for a sequence in the same way that you have a limit for a function. And when we say limit, um, I mean a global limit. And so when a function, uh, when a sequence has a global limit, we say that it converges. converges. So a sequence having a global limit um, is the same as a function having a global limit. Now we never talk about n going to negative infinity because our sequences usually start at n is zero or one. And so we only really talk about the global limit as n goes to infinity. 
And how do we know if a sequence has a global limit? It literally is based on whether or not would the corresponding function have a global limit. And you can see this visually on the graph. Um, so in the first graph, you can see that it's approaching um, this limit, this horizontal asymptote, which we don't really call a horizontal asymptote when we talk about sequences, but it's the equivalent. Um, and then in the second graph, what you'll see is that it approaches by oscillation. So in this case, it approaches by just kind of getting closer and closer to that quote unquote asymptote. In this case, it gets closer to the asymptote because each time it oscillates, it goes a just a tiny bit closer and closer like this. So eventually it's gonna be so close that it's converging to this L. So this is convergence by oscillation. So how can you tell if a sequence is convergent? You can tell by literally pretending like it's a function. And if it's a function and you do the analysis on it, and if the function itself is going to converge, that means that the corresponding sequence converges. And um, so basically that's what this the theorem is saying. It's saying if the corresponding function has a limit, then the sequence that basically matches and has the same equation has a limit as well. So that's how you can tell, which means you can use the hierarchy. So let's say that your sequence is a sub n is n plus one over n. Well, the limit of that sequence, um, n plus one over n, so the limit at infinity, is the same as the limit if this was a function f of x as x goes to infinity. And then we could use the hierarchy, take the most dominant terms, x over x equals one. So we can tell that this sequence would converge. And you can literally just use the hierarchy. Um, positive exponentials, polynomials, logs, constants, negative exponentials. That's it. Now, there are a couple things that we need to add to the hierarchy to uh, to basically account for functions that we now know in BC Calc. So everything else is the same, starting with positive polynomial, I mean, positive exponentials, polynomials, logs, constants, negative exponentials. These are the least dominant things, and these are the most dominant functions. Um, there are two other functions that would go on here, um, and they're not actually functions, they're sequence, um, they're basically sequence factors. And one of them is a factorial. So remember factorial is like, if you have, you know, like five factorial, it means five times four times three times two times one. So that's a factorial. So factorial, grows way faster than a positive exponential. Now, even more than a factorial, you have this function like n to the n or x to the x. So basically something where both the exponent and the base are both um, some type of function of n or of x. And so this is actually even more dominant than anything else. Next, a couple different ways that we can characterize sequences. So I'll give you some of these definitions, and then we'll look at an example about how to, um, how to categorize a sequence. So a sequence is bounded below um, if basically it has a lower bound. And so if L is the lowest number on the list. So for example, if you have the sequence 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1 is the lower bound. So basically, like if you're trying to plot something, and like you're going one, two, three, four, five. This is the lower bound. And maybe it keeps going up forever so it doesn't have an upper bound. It could have both. The lower bound does not have to be the first number. And so your sequence could like start here and it could drop. And then maybe it gets closer and closer to zero or something like that and it never gets there. So if this is your sequence right here, then your lower bound is zero. And that's possible even if the sequence never reaches zero. You can also have a sequence that's bounded above. So bounded above just means that M is the upper bound if basically the nth, all of the terms are less than M for all of the values. So there's an example here, um, 1.9, 1.99, 1.999. 
M is two is the upper bound, even though your function never actually reaches that. Um, so in this case, all of the terms are strictly less than the M and never equal to M, but that's okay. M is still the upper bound. Um, the upper bound can also come at the beginning. So for the sequence, for example, the upper bound is 100. So the sequence has an upper bound of 100. So some other sequence characteristics. A positive sequence is basically bounded below by zero or pretty much means that all of the terms are positive. So this is like a very obvious definition. All of the terms are greater than or equal to zero. Negative sequence is obviously when all of the terms are less than or equal to zero. An increasing sequence is when each term is less than the term that came before uh, is uh, so each term is less than the term that goes after so this is like an increasing sequence so the a sub n this is like a sub n is less than or equal to the a sub n plus one and this is um it can be it can actually be less than or equal to so they could be the same A decreasing sequence is when obviously the opposite happens. So it's when you have the A of n plus one term is less than or equal to A sub n. Next, um, we have a monotonic sequence. So the term monotonic just means increasing or decreasing together. So a function or a sequence can be monotonically increasing or monotonically decreasing. And alternating sequence is what we talked about before, the ones that alternate sign, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. So taking this sequence as an example, we see that, first of all, it doesn't look to be bounded. So it bounces back and forth nine and then negative 109 and then positive 209 keeps bouncing back and forth 409 the next positive is going to be 609 then you're going to have 809 and so on so it's never going to reach an upper bound and same for a lower bound it's going to keep like dropping down and down it's going to have like negative 509 and negative 6, 709 and so on and so forth so it's not bounded at all it's not a positive or a negative sequence because literally the terms alternate so obviously, if your terms are going to alternate, you're, it's not going to be a positive or a negative sequence. It's not increasing nor decreasing because the terms bounce back and forth. They alternate. And so remember, we talked about oscillating um, to a limit. So like we talked about sequences that do this. And I'm drawing it as a function because it's easier to draw. But remember, sequences basically are discrete points. So you can oscillate towards a limit. But you can also oscillate the other way. So that's that's what this one is doing. So you start like small and then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And technically this one is not even, it doesn't really look like that. It's more like something than something than one thing than one thing like that. It doesn't have like all these points in between. Um, so it's neither increasing nor decreasing, but it is alternating. And so for the rest of the chart, what you guys are going to do is basically tell me like which one of these features do these sequences have. And that's it for today's lesson.